Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Today on Earth Focus, British author Mark Linus, author of Six Degrees, Our Future on a Hotter Planet, shares his thoughts on climate change and our options for a sustainable future. Coming up on Earth Focus. Well, every single year the UN, UN sits down and we have great big global summits where representatives from all the world nations try and get a grip of the problem of climate change. And of course, every single year they fail. Now, the reason why this is, is in my view, because it's essentially a, a tragedy of the common situation where no one's willing to make sacrifices for the general good because they as individuals would lose out more. And so you've got a sort of beggar by neighbor approach at all of these negotiations where all of the countries are desperately trying to hold on to their last ton of carbon in, in the negotiations and the general loser is of course the planet. So what we need is a different kind of politics, I think. And uh, to some extent, the way has been shown by the government of the Maldives, who've agreed to go carbon neutral and to do this within 10 years. So if you compare our addiction to fossil fuels to an addiction to opium, they've decided to go clean within a decade. And to try and set a moral and even an economic lead for the rest of the world to follow. It's simply a case of making sufficient investments, and it's simply a case of setting up the the political and the economic incentives that we need to transform to a low carbon economy. No country can solve climate change on its own. I mean the two most critical countries are of course the US and China. But and you know theoretically if they both sat down in a bilateral they could go some way towards solving the problem and that might be a, a good way forward actually because rather than having 180 countries that everyone shouting at the same time and with a different idea but um, the, the the reality is that we're dealing with the actions of six and a half billion people we're all consum consuming fossil fuels it's it's 80 90 percent of our primary energy supply so the entire edifice of industrial human civilization is built on burning carbon. And by, so by any, any standards, it's a huge problem to solve. We've got to substitute technologies which can do more or less the same job, um, but which don't have the, the problem of, of accumulating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, we've got most of those technologies within sight. Certainly, the, the renewables are, are very clearly um, ramping up in magnitude. We need to keep nuclear in the mix, in my very strong view. Um, and there's some options as well for possibly sequestering the emissions from coal-fired power stations and so on. But all of these things are at a very low level, and so we're going to have to increase them by an enormous magnitude over a very short, short space of time if we are to peak the emissions within the next decade or so, which is what science tells us is necessary. Well, the Hadley Centre have done some recent modelling trying to figure out what the, what the plausible, most plausible worst case scenario is, if you, if you say. Um, and if we stay, we're at the moment on a pretty much a uh, worst case scenario emissions trend, although it's gone down a little bit because of the global recession. But um, if you take that and you take the, mo the models which give us the highest rates of temperature change, you could potentially see four degrees of warming as early as 2060, which of course is on the six degree or so scale by the end of the century. So very, very major um, changes which I think would pretty much destroy human civilization as we know it and uh, lead to a mass extinction of natural life. Now both those things are avoidable at this point but only if we respond uh, urgently and that means a complete transformation from business as usual, taking this situation as being an emergency and being prepared to put it at the top of our political and economic priority list. If the temperature rises by four degrees, there's really, I mean, there's, there's no part of the planetary surface which remains unaffected. Uh, even the deep seas will be hugely, hugely altered. The seas will be turning to acid overall as well, so all the coral reefs would be dead. Um, the zones which are currently used to grow crops would be turning into deserts or would be affected by severe weather events. Uh, there's certainly potentially different areas of the land surface could be opened up, but those are areas which are currently covered by forest in, in northern Siberia and places. So I don't, think, I don't think it's really a transformation that we can look at 
as um, at all achievable. And there aren't really adaptation options, let's say, for a four degree world and upwards. Well, one thing that's lacking at the moment is civil society, civil mobilization. I mean, we need to have millions of people out on the streets putting pressure on politicians and saying, this is an electoral issue for you at home. Don't come back from Copenhagen and having failed again, or you'll be kicked out of office. Um, and you know, we, we really have to have that kind of bottom-up pressure, because so far, solving climate change has been a bit of an elite project. Um, it's not something which really comes, comes very high up on most people's uh, lists of political priorities, and that, that, that has to change. Um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that everybody has to become a climate activist, but we certainly need a, a, a higher level of, of mobilisation and engagement than we've seen so far. I mean, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, in the last few years, there's been a huge upsurge, almost a tipping point, in terms of how engaged people are with the climate change issue. But it hasn't really translated into, into political action yet, and Copenhagen really is the, the sort of the final, the last chance saloon for that to happen. Of course, the, the answer is that it's both. Uh, but there's always an opportunity cost to where you spend your money and where you put your effort. And you know, you, you could you could be shifting it more into this side. You could be shifting it more into that side. But uh, it depends on the on the country. I mean, but if, if you're living in the Maldives or Tuvalu or any of the coral atoll nations, what are your adaptation options if the sea levels continue to rise? They're not great. I mean, you could build up the surface of your island a bit, but ultimately your adaptation is going to be moving somewhere else. Um, so adaptation options begin to run out if we allow climate change to rise um, to, 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 to high levels. And that's why you need to bring in the mitigation, the reduction of emissions early. What we need globally is a price on carbon so that all the countries begin to make this transition simultaneously. If we had a 50 to 100 dollar tax on carbon, if we had a, an international quota system where the amount of carbon that was sucked out of the ground or dug out of the ground was subject to a budget and that was auctioned amongst the companies, you could raise trillions of dollars, you could use that to fund adaptation and to fund the transformation in a low carbon direction that we need. Um, but you, you know, that requires the politics to, 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 to be sorted out first. I mean, the sequence I would suggest is that you get the politics sorted, that then changes the economics, which in turn brings on the technologies. Um, at the moment, we're trying to do those things in reverse. Oh, no, I see, I see climate change as a Shakespearean tragedy. It's a bit like the ending of Romeo and Juliet. You can't imagine it ending differently. And, uh, you know, the, the climate change problem is a unavoidable, was an unavoidable byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, humanity has always lived and has developed itself by burning stuff. I mean, we, I, would, I would call us the fire ape, Homo pyrophilius. Uh, that's what really defines us as opposed to other animals. And that's what's enabled us to grow big brains and to develop civilization and develop linguistic skills and so on and so forth. Uh, the cooking, the, the invention of cooking was, was, it was enormously important in terms of our nutrition. Um, so, so combustion has always been important and we were almost destined to have this effect on the biosphere. The point is, I suppose, that burning stuff has allowed us to evolve very big brains and a high level of intelligence, which in turn allows us to imagine and think our ways through these problems in a collective way. Now that's new and that requires cultural evolution that we've not yet had, but certainly the signs are there and I believe it's possible that, um, that we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through this in an intelligent way. Well, I said it's possible that we'll get through this in an intelligent way. I didn't say it was likely. Um, and I suppose that's, that's the, the, the answer to this question. I mean, I'm always asked, are you optimistic, pessimistic? I mean, that's not really the point. I mean, the point is it's, it's possible to, to, to have an optimistic outcome and we should all work towards it. Is it likely? Pro not very. But, I mean, what's the point in admitting defeat before you've even started fighting the war?
Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.